All right, welcome. I'll try that again. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today. It's good to see everyone coming out with the threat of rain. So uh, it's, it's great to also have everyone online who is joining us out there in the Zoom world. So uh, first thing is I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Hall. Um, I'm a researcher from the University of Kansas and I'm a visiting scholar here at the Rebooting Social Media at the Perkins Klein Center. Um, this is actually one of my last events here. It's been a wonderful year and I'm so glad to be here for this conversation today because we're going to be addressing the things that are very near and dear to my own heart um, as my interests lie in issues around wellness and social media use, especially thinking about issues around influencer culture otherwise. So uh, I want to introduce our two speakers today, the two people who are going to be leading this conversation. The first is Amanda Yarnell who is trained as a scientist. She's actually a perfect combination of the journalist and the scientist. Not only a 20 year record of working in journalism, so she understands the ins and outs of how you, you know, form a message, communicate with an audience, get that information out there, but also a research scientist who understands how to evaluate really high quality research. She came to Harvard two years ago to reboot the School for Public Health Center for Health Communication and has since been really working very much with creators and content creators as partners to spread even high quality evidence using uh, platforms such as TikTok and otherwise. We're gonna talk about the work that she's been doing primarily today. The second individual I wanna introduce is Kate Spear up on the screen. Hello, Kate. Uh, so, hey, thanks. Kate is a creator who has participated in the program that Amanda launched that we'll be talking about today. She's also a mental health expert and a mental illness advocate. Um, she's a writer. Her first memoir is forthcoming in 2025. Well, I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing that. And a marketing exec who has scaled the doggest into a community of 5 million dog fans. Apparently, I just heard a story that people were saying the dog was at Harvard. So the dog has its own follower enough to say, we have a, we have a dog spotting. Um, so we're now working with Amanda at the Center for Health Communication to scale its creator experiment. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, an experiment to get high quality information about mental health and well-being into the hands of creators. And I want to really begin with kind of thinking about uh, where was the gener generous, uh, genesis of this idea? Where did it all come from? So hand it over to Amanda. Yeah, so the Center for Health Communication has been around for almost 40 years. Oh, can you hear me very well? No, not at all. How about that? Better? Okay. Um, the Center for Health Communication at Harvard Chan has been around for um, almost 40 years. Uh, it's had a very long history of doing mass media campaigns to support uh, public health um, overall, the most famous of which was in the 80s, um, around designated driver campaign. How many of you have heard of the term designated driver? The reason you have is because of the Center for Health for, for Communication. Still, still not loud enough. Sorry, I'm uh, losing my voice. I had a speaker in yesterday and I talked a lot and now I'm losing it. So I'll try to speak as loudly as I can. Um, so the center has been around for a long time. Designated driver campaign was in the 80s. It really, um, at its core, the center gathered together Hollywood studios, big TV channels, and got them to share public health messaging around the need for designated drivers. Um, got around the TV shows like Cheers into the narrative, the public narrative of the time, the shows we were all watching. Um, but today, the world is really different. Um, the media that we're watching is really different. Um, instead of uh, Cheers and TV and movies, we're all watching TikTok and Instagram. And so the center really thought, okay, you know, what will that kind of public health mass media campaign look like in 2024? it would have to involve creators. Um, so that's where the, um, the idea got its start. Yeah. Um, Kate, you were one of those very first creators. Um, one of the events that I know was very important in sort of getting that information out there to creators uh, was called the Summit. Um, so Kate, what was it like to be at the Creator Summit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, honestly, I was in the throes of my career back then in kind of the digital advertising world. And so I remember getting the email and thinking I was being punked. <laughs> no joke. Um, I just thought the idea that Harvard was reaching out to a creator like myself who shares, you know, unabashed, messy stories about serious mental illness and wanted to work together seemed kind of too far-fetched to believe. So I actually screenshotted the email, sent it to my sister, who's actually also at Harvard, and uh, 
she uh, sent me Amanda's, you know, work bio and her page. And I said, <laughs> okay, well, I guess I better respond. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that was the sentiment across the board. But the summit was really, really special in a number of ways. There were two parts to it. There was an online component that held briefings. And then there was also an in-person part. But I think the first part, which happened in April, which was actually um, when we ran the study, Amanda, well, we as in Amanda, <laughs> uh, was really just this kind of eye-opening experience. It involved briefings accompanied with these toolkits where, you know, this cohort of creators, so this group of creators from all over the world who specialized in speaking about mental health, whether through, you know, personal narrative, so lived experience like myself, or through, you know, licensure and actually being, you know, an academic or a practitioner, um, got exposed to these wonderful faculty members and their beautiful minds. And it was just this incredible invitation to sit down and learn and to be invited in to kind of the front row of all the information that we've been trying to get and trying to better understand and unpack in our content itself. And it really offered... I don't know, I think a window into, into seeing ourselves differently, into recognizing that, oh, wow, we do have a role with our communities and we do have the power to include this information. And now that Harvard is equipping us literally with the you know most up-to-date science, we can do it in a way that is unabashed, which of course the platforms um, support. The more certain you are, the better the content performs. And so the, the summit um, was really special in that way. And it was a, a kind of a gift to be invited and um, still grateful to this day. <laughs> so, That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I was gonna ask kind of as a, as a follow-up to that, you know, when you were invited to go to the summit and began to begin the process of learning about what kind of, well, really loud, um, learning about some, one of, some of those messages that you were able to be exposed to about public health information have your, has your conception of what your role is to your community changed? Because I know that content creators have a really strong connection with their community. They speak to them directly and often interact with them through other ways of communication. And I'm curious, have you now seen yourself more as a public health advocate or perhaps even spoken differently to your, to your audience as a consequence? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I think my understanding has always evolved. It evolves with the platforms. It evolves with each day, right? I mean, I think we have so much change in the space that it's impossible not to um, feel change. But I think the first uh, thing that, that most notably kind of transformed for me was this recognition that I had not only the power to speak to these things, but I also was equipped finally with the correct information. So my background is in marketing. I, you know, I ran influencer campaigns for five years at the dog. It's like millions of dollars to sell dog food. Like we're not talking, like I was never media trained or um, in any way, shape or form academic, um, obviously graduated from college, but past that reading scientific literature was never in my wheelhouse. And I think a lot of the creators, even the ones that were, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists weren't you know, specialized in their ability to read and weed through the literature. And so working with Harvard, where they gave you literally a toolkit, like a PDF that was like, this is the science, this is what you can speak to, this is the most statistically significant information, was a newfound um, confidence, really, that allowed me to step into, I would say, more of a public health advocacy role, because I was no longer kind of do -si doing around <laughs> worried wasn't the full truth or the right truth or the correct truth. And I think what a lot of people don't understand about the ecosystem online, and again, no fault of anyone's, but is there so much hatred out there yeah. online um, for people like me? Uh, even if you have a degree, as soon as you put yourself out there, you are attacked. There are people who are coming for you. And I think a lot of us, and, and I'm going to speak on behalf of the cohort, felt like when we were acknowledged by Harvard, we could step into our role as public health um, advocates more strongly and more capably because we finally had the evidence on our side. And when the hate came out, when people inevitably told us, you know, that 
our suicide attempt should have succeeded or whatnot, because there really are those dark corners of the internet, we could say, no, actually, here's the citation, take it up with, you know, the author. And that, that for me felt like this real gift. Um, and I think that really did translate into me feeling more empowered. But again, I think it was a, a multi-step process. That's wonderful. And you know, one of the questions I want to ask you, Amanda, was I imagine people out there who are like, well, this is a great idea. I would love to get information out to all these content creators. You got to find them first. You have to go to the process of locating folks, but also getting them agreeable to the idea that you know, what you are offering is something that's valuable. So tell us a little bit about the process of bringing creators like Kate to the table at that event. I mean, I think, right, Kate, Kate went to the like, reason creators be open to the idea, um, but how do we find them in the first place? So we didn't go and just pick a random selection of creators on the internet, right? I think, just like anything, there are creators who are creating purely for profit, and then there are creators who are creating for community, right, to serve their audiences. Kate is very clearly on, on one end of that spectrum. I think a lot of the creators that we were engaged with they're towards that end of the spectrum. And so we really were looking for folks who were reaching um, audiences that public health has failed to reach in the past. So um, uh, audiences of color, audiences, LGBTQ audiences, folks that, that public health hasn't served incredibly well in the past. That was one thing we were looking for. Recognizing that creators who are serving those audiences are often suppressed on these platforms we weren't necessarily looking for the creators with the huge followings, although we certainly found some of them um, when we looked. Uh, but we put a really, you know, fairly, not low, but, you know, 10, 15,000 um, followers across TikTok, Instagram um, in terms of their following. So really wanted people who had intimate relationships with their audiences, not necessarily all of them having huge um, relationships with huge audiences. Um, so that was one thing. We, we did have a list of flags, misinformation. We weren't looking for folks who were sort of poised um, to do bad on the internet, right? We were looking for folks who were potentially open. Um, we did not necessarily look for experts. I think it's a really interesting idea in public health as a whole. Um, who should speak for public health? Should information be spread by experts? Should information be spread by you know, traditional experts versus um, those with lived experience that might feel more authentic to the folks that they're trying to reach. Um, so we thought really carefully about bringing both of those kinds of voices into this program to look and see whether the kinds of interventions that we were thinking of, um, the kinds of supports that we might provide, whether those audiences would be really different. So we had gone into it thinking like these are the kinds of folks that we were looking for. So then you know, we used uh, TikTok is, you know, lovely in some ways and terrible in other ways. And we use one of the better, re the better parts of the algorithm, which is it really can help you discover um, what you're looking for. And so really use TikTok to our advantage. So we had built like a little seed cohort of folks from um, experts in mental health, um, which we had picked as our pilot area um, at Harvard Chan. Um, so faculty and students and got together a small group of the kinds of creators that we were looking for and then really looked to the algorithm to help us find more of those folks. Um, we ended up finding about 105 that we vetted um, for all of these, these things uh, and that knowing that we wanted to build this uh, experiment as a, just that, an experiment as a, a field experiment on TikTok. Um, when the time came to see whether we were in fact changing creators' content, some of the things that Kate's talking about, like you know, were they actually showing up on the internet, right, right. as a consequence? Right. Um, so that yeah, we so that's how we designed the experiment. I can talk a little bit more about that uh, if you're interested. I was actually just thinking when you and I had a coffee, you know, a, couple, a few months ago. One of the things that I really enjoyed about that is how much you were committed to an outstanding uh, research design. Yeah. To really say, look, if we're going to put all this work into getting high quality information to creators, how do we evaluate that work to demonstrate that it's really making a difference? And I, I thought this would be a nice time for you to share a little bit on like, the yeah. slides that you have prepared for yeah. the findings of the experiment and, and what ended up happening. Yeah. yeah, it really wasn't intended to be like a brand experiment, right? Uh, like, or, sorry, brand activation. Um, you know, we really were thinking about this as how do we um, 
look and see whether the interventions they were getting, the supports that Kate described, these toolkits that we were offering creators, the um, briefings with fac Harvard faculty experts in mental health, how were they affecting their content? Um, so as I said, we vetted about 105 creators at the end of the day um, that met all of our criteria. We took 20% uh, of them roughly, put them in a control group, never talked to them again. Um, the other folks we, uh, we invited, I wrote them a letter, the letter that, that Kay referred to earlier, and thought they were, I was punking them. That was actually a general thing. A lot came out later uh, as we got to know some of the creators that almost all the creators thought I was punking them um, and ignored me. And first I was like, oh no, no one's, no one's responding to my note. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I think a little persistence paid off. They probably talked, some of them were talking to each other. They decided it was real. Um, so we had about uh, 42 of them respond and wow. say, yes, we'd like to um, apply for a slot in this summit. Um, and then we actually randomly selected um, 25 of them, like Kate, and put them in the summit itself. And then the remainder, uh, we actually only sent them the toolkits. So the okay. idea was now we have two treatment groups, folks who are getting all of these supports, right? And then also um, a group that's only getting the toolkit. And you'll see, I think, we talk about what we learned. Yeah, why don't you share that right now? Tell yeah, us what toolkit why that's out. important. So, uh, yeah, so we just published this work earlier this year. It's in collaboration with Matt Moda at BU, who's been a wonderful collaborator from the jump with me. Um, as well as Yuneng Liu, who is uh, here uh, associated with RSM, as well as uh, a student at Harvard Chan. Um, and we looked at uh, using traditional content coding, uh, about 4,000 videos, 3,500 3, videos on TikTok um, from those 42 creators, as well as the creators in the, in the control group, and compared, um, you know, how did these interventions affect their content. And I thought maybe we could go through a couple of, um, of things that we learned. So first, um, creators who were exposed to our toolkits were significantly more likely to share evidence-based content compared to those who didn't get those materials, right? Um, it really was the toolkits, actually, that made the biggest difference, which I, I was sort of surprised by. That, that was not my uh, expectation going into this, but it does suggest that there's really interesting scaling possibility, yeah. right? So we saw about a 5% uh, increase in um, their likelihood to share evidence-based content. And then we also, which might not sound like a huge number, but when you look at how much views that information got, it's, it's almost close to a million. Um, wow. So like I think if you, you think about it, how simple, scalable, easy, you know, we basically just gave them accessible information. Really? That's all we did um, in a package that they, as Kate mentioned, they believed, they trusted, they felt like um, it wasn't simply just like searching Google and they had to do a lot of work themselves. So I think it lowers the barrier to content creation. Um, if any of you, you know, do this, like it's a big beast to feed. And so we were lowering, lowering the barrier. So that's, that's one thing. Second, um, creators who are exposed to our materials, they just made more mental health content overall compared to creators not exposed to those materials. So it almost like reinvigorated them. And I think, again, that goes back to the, like, you know, creators are, it's, a, it's work, right? It's real, real work. You have to constantly feed this machine of content if, if, if you want to, you know, show up. You want to grow your audience if you want to serve them um, and so yeah we saw this interesting so they're increasing the amount of information on these platforms um, and then as I mentioned creators who saw our, our materials actually saw their content get um, almost 3 million more views on TikTok than before um, so yeah we saw these very significant things suggesting that yes we were influencing the influence Right, based on based on this uh, field experiment that we showed, and you know, we still we picked TikTok because the TikTok API had just come out. You know, TikTok is the wild west. You know, I think we really don't understand it. And to be honest, folks are really looking for health information increasingly on this platform. So I mean, we felt like that was the right place to start, the right place to look. But there's no evidence. There's no reason to think. 
that there's something special about TikTok here, like we think. Right. Um, and we have some um, work underway uh, or planned, I should say, looking, you know, confirming that this is happening on other platforms. But there's no reason to think that it's not, right? Creators are multi platform folks. When they get information, they're looking to see how they can leverage it on all their channels. So we think this is just, you know, these are platforms like TikTok, but the data is from TikTok. That's, I mean, those numbers are astounding, right? I mean, we're looking at millions of more views, so much more content. Uh, one thing I want to ask you, Kate, you were mentioning just a little bit ago that you were feeling more empowered, you know, partly as a consequence <coughs> of you felt like you actually could speak on the issues that you were had personally experienced, but now you, what the second point up here that Amanda shared with us is that, um, you know, increasing mental health content overall was shared. So I was curious in your own process of bringing what you learned uh, from the materials from Harvard, how has that affected the way that you created the videos? Did it change your kind of thinking about the stories that you wanted to tell or the way that you told them? Because I know that personal, authentic relationship with your audience is really what brings people to the table. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it definitely did. I think, I think there's a dynamic that most people don't realize and you know i'm 36 so when i grew up mental health wasn't talked about like it was taboo to say mental health and no one ever said mental illness i remember saying it once at my dinner table with my grandfather and grandmother and i was like sent to time out because you just don't say that grandma has a mental illness like it's that bad and so i think i think the first thing it did was for all of us who were in that similar headspace that grew up where stigma and shame were just front and center was it valued us it saw us and I think we know this right when someone is seen and heard they bloom and I think in a lot of ways Harvard honoring me by including me in the program allowed me to say oh wow this really does matter wow they care they're listening and I've always known it matters to my community um I live with a very weird condition called PTSD dissociative fugue disorder. And it's a result of, you know, about 10 years being misdiagnosed that resulted in intermittent psychosis. And so my community is very specific to the demo one of the demographics <coughs> that Amanda was mentioning, which is just a group of individuals who live with serious mental illness. And I think before that, I had created content as a way to offer just solidarity but I think when Harvard really both equipped us and engaged with us, it really changed the way I thought about how I could live in service of my community. And I've always wanted to offer just support and love and solidarity, but the idea that I could provide information that was valuable to them, that it could inform their lived experiences, that it could offer assistance, felt really, really empowering. And I think the way that it shifted was I started to build out series, literally, because I started to recognize that my story not just mattered, but could marry to the information in a way that could really connect with others. So before where I might have mentioned something and then put a like brief little fact at the bottom of a caption, I built content off of the data. And I think that was something that we saw not just from me, but from other creators. And that was a really powerful change in both what I created and also how my community responded to it. And, and I was one of the individuals who did see this boost in both viewership and then also just engagement and you know quality of content. And I think it came through across all the creators channels, but it was really powerful to live it firsthand. Yeah, I also think it's interesting, like, we only compared, um, just to make this study manageable, right, a month before and a month after the intervention. And I can tell you anecdotally what we're seeing is that it did, you know, for a lot of creators, that month was just the start, right? They're still sharing much of the information um, that, that we, should, we gave. Yeah, and that kind of long-term effect in terms of change in big creators' behavior. You know, I was curious, man, if you had other things that you wanted to share with us about how different creators, um, beyond Kate's exceptional experience, um, yeah. really changed how they deliver content. Yeah. Uh, first, maybe Kate can tell us a little bit about, uh, I think there's an example that Kate, coming out of the summit with um, some advocacy work that she did with one of our faculty, which is an example one of the pieces of research that we're doing right now. So maybe she can start by telling us about that. 
Totally. I think, um, I think that's a great place to start just because I think what we've discussed so far is actually not limited in scope, but literally representative of the virtual briefing. And there were 14 of us that came to an in-person summit in August of last year. And that really catapulted what had started in April. And we saw in that like month after kind of collection phase into something that really grew. Um, and that was where we got to literally sit down, have meetings with faculty, one-on-ones, roundtable discussions. And in one of those, and this was when I was finally realizing I could, you know, use influencer marketing for good instead of profit, which I've always known and wanted to do. But it was just so eye-opening sitting down with all of these faculty and all of us were talking in such excited kind of dynamic ways about hot button topics to be connected with people who weren't just giving us information. They were also offering us ways to change policies. And this is what kind of launched Bryn Austin, the wonderful faculty member who runs Striped, to reach out to me and we built out a public health campaign like a beta basically a soft campaign kind of what i would call a beta i.e you know not a hundred roster you know creators in my roster like only like five or ten and we basically advocated to get this bill that had been on governor Hochul's desk in new york across um across the finish line and what that really that work was about was basically kind of capping off all sales, literally like prohibiting sales of weight loss supplements to youth. So anyone 18 or older, and these, you know, scientifically have been proven time and time again, increase body image issues, eating increased likelihood of eating disorders. And they also have some serious harm, just physical harm because of the lack of regulation and oversight within the supplement industry at large. And doing that work together really <laughs> just brought a newfound understanding, I think to both me and and the whole cohort, which was just that we can not just equip people with the information, we can advocate and change the systemic failures that are so ingrained in the healthcare system right now. And that I, I remember, you know, texting with one of the things about the in-person was that we all became a community. Like they are now my friends. I text with them regularly um and you know we check we you know bob content ideas off but i remember when the new york bill we ran this like brief campaign and we increased from you know a typical 150 signatures up to like 750 like we saw a real positive action alert increase um i just remember all these creators saying wow like we could actually change policies and um I know that sounds so trite and like probably dumb that we aren't thinking that way, but it's a really lonely world when you're just here in your box. It's like me today. I'm like, it's out there. I don't even know who am I talking to? Um, <laughs> you're just kind of lost in a sea, like a mirage of your own making. And um, I just remember feeling like the tactile reassurance of, oh my gosh, we could shift policy. So instead of this continuous narrative that like, the person has to figure out the mental health challenge. It could be that we could empower change for the system to serve that individual instead of fail it. And um, yeah, I think I think that for me and for them, all of us just felt like, oh wow, if we really did this and we did this together, we could, we could actually make a difference. And um, I think that's the legacy, you know. Amanda and I are trying to build from this project really, and and be able to translate it, you know, across not just mental health, but public health at large. I Actually, I, I, uh, as an academic, I very much relate to this idea that you do all this work on something, you put it into ether, and you never know, like, mm -hmm. does anyone read my article? Does anyone care? And so, you know, similar to you, when I have opportunities to talk about my own work about friendship or about communication, it's like I'm so excited to share it with a broader audience because I feel like I can make it a you know, a real difference in their lives. But the idea of changing policy, that's a whole other level of, of you know, accomplishment. And it brings me back to a question I wanted to ask you, Amanda, yeah. you know, how is this gonna scale up in the future? Or do you see it as a yes. scalable option for moving We forward? do, we do. I mean, I think um, one of the things that we're trying to do next is uh, to demonstrate some of these other changes that we're seeing in creator beliefs, behaviors, right? Like what Kate talked about. So how does putting 
creators and experts and conversation, how does it affect more than just their content, but everything else? So Kate gave an example. There are a few others here. Maybe I'll call out this one where one of the creators is actually bringing it into their practice, right? Oh, wow. So not just, um, so affecting real life communities, not just digital communities. So if you think of these creators as like, you know, community, digital community health workers, they're also taking it offline into their, their real communities. So that's one thing we're doing is we're thinking about like, how do we gain, how do we get the evidence that we would need to scale it? We're also looking about um, for more cost effective, cost efficient ways of connecting creators with the evidence. This is work that we're doing um, this summer in partnership with Social Current, which is a um, social impact focused uh, influencer marketing firm. Um, connects creators with brands that want to do um, social impact focused uh, campaigns. Uh, and so we'll be looking at how do you optimize these toolkits? How would you optimize these briefings? How could you look even beyond that and think about how you might use AI based um, translation models in order to help connect many, many more creators um, with the kind of evidence that helped Kate and her cohort. Um, and I would argue the, the ecosystem, mental health ecosystem on, on TikTok last year. Um, and then also, I think maybe the other really important thing that we're doing right now is looking um, into whether we're influencing viewers' beliefs and behaviors, right? Because of course, you don't simply want to change um, information ecosystems, you know, for the sake of that, right? You want it because people are using them. So we, we, we know this is going to happen, but we're looking at this in two different ways. So one, looking back at um, the 450,000 comments that were left on the videos in our TikTok uh, field experiment last year, um, how does mental health literacy show up in that? How do people's beliefs and behaviors about mental health show up? How do they talk about misinformation, for example, about mental health there? And how are they talking about the evidence that we introduced? So it's a really interesting opportunity to look at that data. Um, that again, we're building a large language model that would help us do that. They're trained with human coders, very similar to how um, we did the study last year. Um, and then we're also doing pairing that with a really much more traditional survey-based RCT where we're actually partnering with a creator, paid member of our research team um, to you know, make content before and after some of our interventions and then looking at uh, 14 to 22 year olds in a YouGov type uh, survey um, RCT to see you know, how, do, how does exposure to these um, kinds of evidence-based content uh, created by creators who have had these interventions, how does it change beliefs and behaviors? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, this is what I was talking about when I introduced you, right? the combination of knowing journalism and science yeah. makes you want to test this more rigorously, yeah. think about audiences, are we making a difference? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly where it needs to go to really demonstrate that it's applicable to, to, the, to the audience at large that you're, you're drawing from. Um, you know, one question that I wanted to kind of continue to think about is, I think Kate, you already alert, alert, uh, alluded to this in talking about, you know, the bill around weight loss supplements, um, moving from not just a mental health advocacy, but also to physical health advocacy. And, you know, how has this experience kind of changed how you think within that space or, or perhaps even amongst the other creators that you're still in conversation with? Is this for me? Yeah. yeah for okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, well. Oh, I've got a lot to say about that one. So buckle up. No, I'm just kidding. Don't worry. I won't, <laughs> won't bore you all. Um, this is where I get really excited. Uh, I think, I mean, basically uh, it's opened my eyes to really just the power of utilizing what I did for five years to sell dog food and dog insurance um, for public health. Uh, I think we've seen it time and time again. I mean, I think the, the example that pops into mind continuously when I think about the effectiveness of influencer marketing is the Stanley quencher. I know we're all tired of it. Believe me, I got it. Like I got it. You're tired. I'm tired. We're all tired, but it's because of influencers that that product is so successful. They almost discontinued it until these three women picked it up and built an influencer marketing campaign. And I think that my hope is we can do that for a variety of health issues. I mean, I really believe that there is a huge difference between an influencer and a creator influencer doing it for the bottom line and a creator doing it for their community. 
And I think if we can tap into creators and their communities, we have the power to not just change the conversation, but also educate and change policy. And that's where I really hope we're able to take it in these coming years, where we can work on affordable access, where we can work on women's rights, where we can where we can really look at, you know, whether it's a diabetes focused creator or it's someone who has endometriosis, where you can really kind of tap into what has undoubtedly become a trusting relationship. The parasocial bond is real. They've studied, you know, it's been proven. And I think thinking about them instead of as, oh, that's pathetic. We need to get rid of social media and instead saying, oh gosh, that's powerful. How can we harness it? That's my hope is where we can utilize all of these many, many frames that marketing has so successfully sold products under, but do it for public good. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's when I think of the, you know, the legislation that got passed last year. And I think about doing more campaigns about that same issue in other states this year. Um, yeah, that's my hope is that we can really take it and move it and apply this methodology. It's as simple as a PDF. I mean, it can't be that hard, right? Um, to get it out the door, to recruit more members um, of a creator collaborative and then scale to other areas of focus outside and beyond mental health. Yeah, I mean, I really like what you said about the distinction between a creator versus an influencer. I think that's a really savvy way to look at it. And I'm, uh, I'm reminded of a, a graduate student of mine who did a project on Twitch and the way that a gaming community, when uh, the, the, basically the content creator there was sharing personal stories about their family or about how they felt about them making money through playing games. And the audience was like cheering them on and showing that kind of support when, you know, between each other. So not only is this an influencer or a, a creator culture from creator to the audience, but the audience members within each other supporting one another around issues around mental health and physical health and well-being. So I think it has a lot of potential. Um, I want to open this up to questions, both online and in person, but I thought I would ask one more opportunity to kind of say what kind of take-home messages that Amanda and Kate would like to share with us before we open the door to questions. So Amanda, any concluding thoughts before yeah. Q&A? For me, I think the future of public health communication is going to be distributed and yeah. we need new kinds of coalitions um, and new kinds of voices. Uh, you know, I increasingly think of these folks, creators like Kate, as digital community health workers, thinking about how do we expand that communication workforce. It's going to be necessary as we move forward, especially in a time of generative AI, um, where ecosystems where we get our media are just noisier, they're more fractured than ever before, we're all going into our own lanes. Um, it's going to be really important. That we, that we think about how do we spread that, build new kinds of coalitions who can help public health um, communicate critical health information. Yeah, and I really credit you and uh, the public health team there thinking ahead about how we could take models that apply to cheers and apply it, <laughs> <laughs> apply it to everyday environments now. Uh, Kate, any last thoughts before uh, we open up for Q&A? Um, I, think, I think just don't overlook the power um, that's right in front of you. Um, you know, a simple note, there are people with millions and millions of followers who care about the same things you do, and they come from a very different background, undoubtedly, but they want to help. And so I think one of the things that really blew me the way the most was Bryn Austin sending me an email. And, um, you know, it was so humbling. I was so honored. And I think we don't often think, oh my gosh, let's build alliances between content creators and academics uh and yet i think we should um and i think the power lies there in recognizing that these that stories save lives and um communities cultivate change and uh we're all on the same team at the end of the day we just want to help people and uh yeah i, think I love that remember love reaching that. out yeah thank you so much uh questions yeah Thank you so much. This is uh, fascinating. I, I do agree with what Amanda just said, that the future is distributed. And uh, I, I wanted to share a concern, because this is very dear to me. Uh, as context, I founded a, a think tank in Brazil with Brazil's biggest YouTuber. So almost 50 million subscribers. We have a network of 
creators that are in the tens of millions, and we do something very similar with tech policy. And my PhD thesis at, at Oxford is on how an anti-scientific network used uh, social media to promote hydroxychloroquine and all that stuff during COVID. And to go to my concern is that this uh, type of dynamic was very informative in Brazil, and it was extremely useful to get information out there uh, for the population, what to do, lockdowns, and, and so on. But the authority of the institutions backing science did not go untouched, to the extent that when the Senate was promoting an inquiry, uh, investigation on the federal government's response, social media creators were being summoned. So next to the authorities, university deans, chief of the FDA, and so on, you had a creator. And uh, it also enabled disinformation to gain traction and distort science and so on. Uh, and about making policy, an hour ago, I just got this photoshopped image because my co-founder supported a platform regulation bill and somehow this caught on by far right and now I'm not famous, but I'm getting this sort of hate online. Oh. So this isn't to, I totally agree. I absolutely believe in everything with everything you're saying, but I wanted to share this concern. The realities. I don't see the way out. And if you do, I <laughs> or reflections. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there is a, a, like a perfect way out. I think that part of the value here is that collaborative, right? So what we've been seeing is that when um, one creator is, ex, uh, you know, experiencing that kind of hate, that the other creators in the cohort are helping them, if that makes sense, right? So I think that that's one thing. Um, it's not just like, what could Harvard do for the creators? It's what the creators could do for each other. So I think that that's one like possibly tempering factor. Um, you know, there's hate's not going to go away. I think you know Kate <laughs> described it very like creators have been dealing with that for a very long time, um, and so I don't think that there's anything that we're gonna like no magic bullet that we're gonna make that stop. But I do think there's power in the the collaborative to withstand it, if you will. Thank you. I think I'd, I'd also add that both Amanda and I are huge proponents for regulation. So yeah. this is this is not the idea of like, yay, social media, all in. Um, <laughs> and I think that often gets uh, kind of distorted as we get so excited about seeing something actually change, you know, an ecosystem for the better. Uh, but I fervently believe that the future is one where social media is regulated, where we do have checks and balances on misinformation. And I think, although it's very, very small, uh, it is a great step that we are seeing, you know, YouTube take that first step forward with YouTube Health, where it does certify practitioners who are giving evidence-based information. And my hope is in time, there will be ways to you know, the same way you can add a little like goofy bird gif doing the dance, you can add a citation. Again, maybe that's lofty, but I think the real hope is that we do weather that long road to regulation to address these massive issues, these massive failures that are just intrinsic in the ecosystem. And in the meantime, we also leverage it. It's, it's at least from where I sit, it's definitely a both and. We have a question uh, online from David Craig uh, oh, for David. Amanda. Um, when identifying creators, do you recommend creators who have already built a community around these topics or creators who haven't but may align around a specific health message? Yeah, I think uh, both, right? Uh, so we definitely saw that, well, I'm thinking back to like the kinds of um, uh, toolkits that we offer folks, right? There's a variety of different topics I didn't go into we didn't see every topic hit. What we saw was when a creator saw some portion of alignment with their content, that's when they're more likely to use it. Um, but I do think like as time goes on, when they're in a cohort, they've been exposed to something that um, they do see some connection to, they're more willing to go to a different topic that they might not have been, uh, you know, done any content around. So I think they have to see some even tangential connection um, to their work, build some trust around that. And then I do think you have a, you have a big opportunity to then expand. So climate, 
um, anxiety is a perfect example, right? Um, in the initial study, we did some training around um, climate, the relationship between climate and mental health. None of these creators were making anything about climate, but we saw it you know, in the School of Public Health, so we're seeing it as an intersectional issue, climate and mental health. Um, and, uh, you know, really it was one of the least um, in toolkits that showed the least, least the creators showed the least interest in at that point. But as we saw as time went on, creators, um, you know, worked with us on some of the other toolkits that they were all of a sudden open to other topics that perhaps they wouldn't have seen themselves in immediately. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a both, to be honest. But the beginning, there has to be some sort of point of, of, uh, of, of contact. I was actually curious, Kate, to kind of a follow-up question on this is, um, would you, do you, amongst the other creators that you've gotten to know through this process, do you see yourself as perhaps recommending content to one another? Like, do you have a sense in which, like, oh, you know, I think this would be great for you. I just saw this material coming out. I think you would, re your audience would really, you know, resonate with this. What, what do you think? Yeah, we do that for sure. Exactly. I mean, Amanda just the other day sent one of my girlfriends, well, one of the fellow creators. She's like, one of my girlfriends. Literally, we text all, like, pretty much every other day from the program, um, you know, a content idea. And she started sending me different versions of the video. But yeah, I, we have um, a group like direct message, which is basically the online email with built in to Instagram. Um, and we have ideas flowing through there all the time. And I we definitely have DMs going both ways. Like, have you seen this content idea? Or have you checked this out? Like, this is hilarious. It'd be perfect for you and your cats. Or like, you know, there's a whole continuum of of kind of feedback and I think that's you know for me one of the things that's been so interesting is just how powerful it is to find a community and I, I know we we know this in public health we know this in life when you have a community you show up for them and I think content creating is so isolating it's you know it's a lot like academia until you find your people you know you're like this is my grant crew you know it's like my husband's Always like, I finally found my collaborators. He's got a PhD, he's a total nerd. And it's like the difference when he does things independently versus not is night and day. And I think the same thing applies here in that we're all on the same team and we're all doing it together. And it, it, it's very engaged and dynamic. And it's, it's honestly, it's finally fun again, which, which is definitely stopped being <laughs> prior to coming. That's outstanding. We, we run a monthly community call where folks also like, trade ideas and say they've done something and they support each other. And I think in an age where um, algorithms often decide for you what you're going to see or what's going to surface on these on these platforms, um, there are ways that, you know, these these kind of creator networks are helping yeah. content see the light of day um, you know, through other means. I can even see those community calls, you know, multiplying in such a way where yeah. you know, more and more calls and people can uh, content creators can shift between the call they're taking to learn more about some topic and yeah. get to know a new set of content creators sharing knowledge. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I think we had a question within the audience here. <laughs> so what can we learn from this about using social media influencers or creators to increase acceptance of vaccination, not just COVID and flu, but also like childhood shots like measles where there's been some decline in, in compliance lately? So we're actually, funny you should say that, thinking about this right now um, with uh, Matt Moda, my uh, colleague at BU, um, that's his, he actually, his other side of his research is around vaccine hesitancy and vaccine attitudes. Um, so that actually happens to be sort of his bread and butter. Um, and we're thinking very carefully about how we might do some of this um, with some colleagues at Harvard Chan, Kismikia Corbett Hilaire, who is one of the inventors of the um, um, uh, mRNA vaccine for COVID, is very interested in doing more vaccine communication, is already starting to do that in our own channel. She's an influencer in her own right, and we've been starting to think about how do we do some more um, collaborations with parent influencers with a scientist influencer. So we have some ideas there. That we'll be testing in the next year or so. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We, I picked mental health, honestly, because like lots of people are interested in mental health. 
Um, uh, but uh, as, as Kate, I think, said so eloquently, like we think this is not a mental health program, it's a public health program, lots of different areas in which um, you have, you know, community health, digital community health workers who could potentially help you, um, you know, communicate really key public health information to their communities. When you're working with um, creators, what kind of boundaries, if any, do you recommend in their content creation and relating to um, just the fact that there's a tension between, potentially a tension at least, between optimizing view count and you know staying true to the facts or recognizing the limitations of the science? Yeah, I mean, we don't necessarily, we have no control over this, right? This is a coalition, not a like directed, Harvard's not paying these creators to do, so we don't have control, right? But we certainly have talked a lot about um, with folks about what their goals are. Again, I think it goes back to what Kate said earlier about the creators in our program, the creators that we think really have the potential to gauge here are the ones who are making it for their communities. So they're thinking very carefully about the people who are following them right now. What's of value to them? And if they think that that evidence is important, then that's it, important. But I think there are also many ways into this, right? So like some creators may choose to talk about the evidence um, and feel like they have certainty because they've backed up by the toolkit, but they're not listing like, this is where I got you know statement one from, this is where I got statement two from, right? Like, it's not necessarily like about showing all the research papers from which they got it. They're interpreting how to provide the conclusions from that evidence to their audience. So I think it really depends on the creator and their audience, and I think that they know best. So, Kate, do you want to add anything to that as somebody who's, I think, done that really eloquently? I don't know if I've done it eloquently. I've done it too. <laughs> I think so. I'm a goofball, <laughs> so I'm proud of you that. Um, no, I think, I think. I'm a following of goofballs, so like that's, that's the vibe. True, right? it's my vibe. So, if you think of me like a puppy, we'll get along great. Um, I think basically, I think to that effect, again, I think echoing Amanda's point um, that like we were never, this wasn't a content brief. So this was not a paid campaign. So there was no like contract. If you are to do that, I think the first thing to note is if you are to do that, then that's where, you know, you can insert and having really clear calls to action, clear language, I think looking actually at the toolkits that Amanda so beautifully crafted for last year and the and the ones that we'll be doing this year would be a really great place to start to be able to see how to effectively craft language for creators specifically. I think that would be step one. And then I think the second thing is to think about, um, yeah, I think think about the fact that you are asking them, and I, this is just really echoing Amanda's point, which is just that they speak the language of their community and that more often than not, as terrifying as it might be to trust that they know their people best, they do. They really do. And they share the intention, if you know, vetted appropriately. And so I think leaning into them speaking their language. So if it's me being goofy, a little bit goofy, like some, I got to infuse humor into serious mental illness content. It's the only way I can get through the day. <laughs> But I think, you know, most people be like, are you kidding, Kate? That's really offensive. And yet my community loves it and it's what works. And so I think that's where it's thinking about that as a collaborative, as a, as a, as a team activity. I think that will also help. You know, and this reminds me too, is when I went to graduate school, um, my advisor was an expert or had worked a lot with Hollywood on getting messages out there. And one of the studies that he had conducted found that narratives work a lot better than facts in yeah. persuading people. And what I think that content creators do so well is that not only is there a narrative, but you have a parasocial relationship with the content creator. So you're deeply invested in what happens in that person's life. So the combination of narrative plus personal relationship plus high quality information, I can see this really playing a huge role in uh, persuading individuals to make you know, good, good information, informed choices. Yeah, I think we have another question online. Yeah, we have uh, two questions online. Um, the first maybe is curious about some initial findings of the comments and viewers' behaviors and, and beliefs. Have you seen, even anecdotally, uh, anyone shift their opinion or position radically um, on a specific uh, uh, topic related to public health? Creators? Uh, oh, no, uh, audience. Oh, audience. Or, uh, either, one, either one. Okay, yeah. I think okay. Uh, too early to say anything about audience. 
um, about creators specifically, uh, one example I could share is in our conversations, we had some really interesting conversations around people feeling uncomfortable talking about mental illness, right? And like what words we use to name things. And I think it was a very interesting um, discussion around like inclusive language. So this is not so much like the specific piece of evidence, but again, I think this other power that we're doing um, in terms of training them to be um, using best practice in health communicate, health and science right. communication as well, that cuts across every topic that they do, not just, you know, can you talk more about X, uh, for example, or could you talk about X in this way, um, different than how you've been doing it in the past. And so I think that's, a, that's an example of, of one where it was like a real light bulb moment, and um, we've heard creators, um, you know, lean into that subsequently. Yeah, another question online is um, from someone who's curious about applying your experiment and research design in cultural and museum settings, uh, but also just maybe any Very advice you might offer for, for generally applying this. Yeah, of I mean, we I obviously we haven't thought about that in the past, but we have been thinking about like, you know, how can you, I think it's a, sim, a very similar example of, an, of a person who is, uh, you know, trusted in a specific environment, right, a specific community that like in a museum or, or so forth, like a docent type situation. Um, and I think it would be a really interesting experiment to see how do you equip them, what kind of information could you equip them with, um, and look at their the beliefs and behaviors of their audience. I think you'd have to think about how you survey them coming out. But yeah, call me. <laughs> we can brainstorm. Um, it's a really interesting idea. And we have another question online, but also want to um, uh, make sure we get to the folks in the room as well. But another one um, from David. Um, Asking uh, for Amanda, according to polls, right-wing cable news networks are leading proponents of medical disinformation, more often speaking to older audiences um, who are less likely to use social media. So are we looking at a vast generational divide in terms of public health messaging? I think we're looking at a vast divide in how everyone is getting their information, right? Like we're going to a world in which we're all going to get it from individual, um, you know, our own carefully sculpted media diet, right? And it's gonna be, again, I think this goes back to the point of, um, you know, coalitions are gonna be more important than ever before and arming many, many people with information that's gonna be more important than ever before. Um, you know, I think in those kinds of situations, it may not be, uh, it could be that cable news network anchor, right, is the, is the actual creator that you're, targeting in that kind of scenario, right? Um, uh, you know, increasingly this line between creators and all kinds of folks that people are getting news and information on from is blurring. Right? Actually makes me wonder, I was gonna ask you a call-up question, Kate, on this too, is do you, did you, have you felt in, in using this information to speak to your audience that there has been um, any pushback or have you noticed any sort of reactions that might speak to kind of David's concerns or others' concerns that the audience that you've built may not 100% be ready or be interested or even be accepting of the messages that you're delivering. Um, one reason might be because of the earlier question, because it's from Harvard and there's a sense in which I don't need authorities telling me what to do, but also might just be a resistance to a certain message or a certain way of understanding things. So I'm just curious, have you had that experience? I have had, um, well, I would say, I would say I've had kind of a diverse experience in that kind of range of experiences with regards to that. Um, I would say actually the most backlash I've gotten is actually from fellow academics. Um, that's been pretty interesting. Um, the way that I do my content is undoubtedly um, human and it is nowhere near as um, specialized. I am not a scientist, I am a storyteller. Uh, that's kind of how I think of myself. And so I think it's been really interesting to see my community <coughs> love it. I've gotten incredible feedback. And then from other, you know, not within the, the Harvard network, but within outside networks, I've had from a few different universities, some pretty stern messages about how I didn't speak to it correctly and that that was a violation. And I've, I've been kind of jeopardizing the well-being of my audience. And so that's, that's been a, a pretty interesting um dynamic, but I think from the community side, it's been um, almost universally supported. 
Uh, people are really, you know, I, I get a lot of the messages saying, oh my gosh, Kate, it's about damn time you stepped into teaching <laughs> us this stuff. <laughs> so, you know, I think, you know, it's a yin yang for sure, but I'm, I'm grateful the community resonates with it. Uh, on behalf of the academic community, first I want to say sorry for those jerks. So sorry about that. Uh, want to All say. Good. All good. But the other is, is that any area around social media these days, there's so much academic disagreement. I'm also kind of not surprised, right? It's like, I think the public believes academia speaks with one voice, and that is the furthest thing from the truth in my own experience, especially around issues as difficult and challenging as, as mental health. So, so yeah, are there other questions from the audience? We're kind of running out of time, or? I, I have a question, I might slip in with one. Sure, go ahead. Um, I'm just curious uh, if you guys, is there a role for platforms to play in these sort of partnerships, or is it best for them to sort of step back and let civil society and creators uh, figure out what's best? Just curious about, yeah, generally what sort of platform involvement could look like, or whether it shouldn't, it shouldn't be for us. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll let Kate also take a stab at this, but in my view, right, uh, platforms already have relationships with creators, right? They're already in conversation with creators. Uh, so I think there's a huge possibility for platforms possibly helping to connect the right creators into these programs, surfacing these kinds of resources, right? I don't think um, you know they're likely to be the ones who should be training up their creators, but I do think surfacing the kinds of, um, of resources that a program like this might offer is very much um, in their interest, um, right? Improving the information um, that's on a platform is in general in their interest, especially in an age of generative AI. Yeah. I don't know whether Kate has anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's a role and I think there's a need for it. I think right now the answer on most platforms has been to just suppress specific language and subjects instead of to engage and navigate them with thoughtfulness and nuance. And I mean, we're seeing it right now on Instagram most notably, but we've been seeing it across all platforms. If you use the word suicide, if you use the word serious mental illness, you're flagged and your content doesn't reach your community. And I think if platforms were willing to engage with us and say, okay, we wanna to work together to improve the ecosystem so that we get more evidence-based information out there and do so in a way that utilizes actually the correct language that would further destigmatize all public health considerations. Um, I, think, I think that would be a tremendous um, potential. And uh, it's honestly something I really hope happens because it, it's really needed right now. We, um, the blanket suppression is, is really problematic for public health at large, but also just general political issues, well-being issues, community-based issues. It, it, it's a real challenge. So okay. one more question online. Do I take it and then call it a day? Oh, I think that might just be a residual chat. Okay. Oh, oh, no. Oh, there is a new question. Sorry, it just popped up. Mm -hmm. um, yes, recognizing that there are problematic aspects of how social media algorithms and marketing practices can promote uh, misinformation. Um, aside from calling for regulations of platforms, are there ways for these influencers to resist some of these dynamics? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think there are like financial, uh, right? There, there are financial reasons that uh, influencers are making these choices. There are incentives, both at the platform level, but also like they're just incentives that, you know, corporations, industry funded disinformation, they're making investments in this. You don't see that same kind of investment being made by public health. And I think that that is high time that that changed. Um, but this is definitely Kate's area. So I will let her also uh, take a stab at that. No, I mean, you've nailed it. It's, it's, you've got to pay for it, unfortunately. I think that's, that's where you need to invest in this space. And I think the dynamic is that influencers and creators both, although, you know, entirely, influencers entirely, but creators partly are making their living. They are, you know, making their living doing this work. And so if, you know, I mean, a great example is going back to the supplement issue. And I think this speaks to it best, but it's like in when I was interviewing and vetting people to participate in the campaign to, you know, get that bill across Hochul's desk, um, I had, you know, five different conversations with some very intelligent, capable, body positive, you know, fat liberation advocates and they all said no, because if they actually participated in that campaign, 
they would lose over a hundred thousand dollars worth of annual revenue, each of them, because supplement companies are paying them that much money. And they wouldn't just lose it that year. They would lose it in perpetuity, which means for the next decade, they would be walking away from, a, you know, a million dollars. So it's, it's this dynamic where we, as you know, public, I'm not, we, I'm a general public health, but I think recognizing that corporations are funding this. They are funding the misinformation. They're funding the perpetuous just dynamic of capitalism that is just spewing information. And the only way to combat it is to invest right back and to, you know, pay people to actually change these conversations to actually improve people's lives. Or, you know, just get rid of capitalism and then we'd all be, you know, like maybe you should just be pro socialism. Like, should we do that? Like I could go there too. But I think really the answer is in order for influencers to not fall in that trap, they need to not lose a hundred thousand dollars worth of income. And um, that's pretty hard if you're trying to feed your family. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's such a great place to end. I think these are complex <laughs> dynamics. Yeah, I couldn't have said better. Round of applause, please. for our <laughs>